Amen. Well, go ahead and grab a seat. Glad you could be here tonight. Um, if you didn't get one of the handouts that you can take notes on if you'd like, uh, you can raise your hand and somebody will get one to you. But I think they were doing a pretty good job of passing them out. Well, tonight we're going to look at the person of the Holy Spirit, person and work of the Holy Spirit. If you were with us when we talked about God as a triune being, God as a trinity, um, we developed quite a bit the idea that although it's not something that's easy for us to understand, that the Bible teaches clearly that the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, but there's only one God, and each of them are completely God. Um, they're not just part of God. So, you know, your brain starts to explode just trying to figure it out, but it's not my job to figure it out. It's my job to just believe what the Bible says, and, and that's what it clearly teaches. Just as a reminder, um, we had, if you look back at that outline, or you can always get one from the office if you didn't get it, and eventually we're going to put these outlines on, on uh, the web page as well for people. But... Um, Matthew 28, 19 is one of the many verses where Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are mentioned together. And as we discussed, it's completely absurd to think that, like in that case, it's Jesus saying, baptizing people in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, that you would include the Son and the Spirit with the Father in that way, treating them as equals, if in fact they weren't equals and in fact gods. If you look back at the other outline, there are a whole lot of other verses that do similar things. Um, then specifically, and we had looked at this when we talked about the Trinity as well, 1 Corinthians 3.16, which says that, you know, it talks about our body being the temple of God because the Holy Spirit dwells in us. So clearly in that verse, the Holy Spirit is God. I don't think I have to labor that too much more. But he is God and he lives within us. But what I'd like you to do is turn over to John chapter 14 because the greatest amount of teaching that we have on the Holy Spirit is from Jesus himself. And it comes in various sections of John chapter 14, John chapter 15, and John chapter 16. On Sundays, we, as we're going through the Gospel of John, it'll be several weeks down the road that we'll be getting to these chapters and going into them in depth. They're really important chapters because John 14, 15, and 16 is Jesus giving the disciples last-minute instructions when he knew that he was about to go and die. And so he's telling them the things that they needed to know the most and central to what Jesus wanted them to understand is the role of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And so um, we can look first at John 14, beginning with verse 15. He says, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Notice that, you know, he is saying, when I leave, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And what, is, what does this tell us about the Holy Spirit? He, he's a helper. He's there to come alongside us to help. There, some of the translations say comforter, but the, the word really means someone who's, who pulls up alongside somebody to, to lead them, to guide them. Parakaleo is the word para means alongside of, and kaleo means called. And it's like Jesus says, come here and be with these people. And so he's a helper. He's not there to hurt us. He's there to help us. Um, it also says that he's going to be with you forever. So the Holy Spirit isn't a temporary stopgap like He'll be with you until you get to heaven, or he'll be with you until you're back with me again. He's like, no, when I send the Holy Spirit to you, he will be with you forever. He's coming alongside you, and he'll always be there. He will have a role in your life for all of eternity. And notice that he's called the, 
the spirit of truth in verse 17. The Holy Spirit is desperately needed if we're going to know the difference between truth and lies. There are so many lies out there. There are so many things that are thrown at us because the devil, who on another night we will talk about the devil and demons and all that stuff, um, you know, he, the devil, his whole thing is lying. That's what he does. Anytime somebody lies, they're kind of playing along with the way that he does things. But, I mean, you know how much in life you could use some ability to be able to hear a lie and know that's crazy. I mean, some people have good discernment. Some people don't at all. Some people are simply, you know, a a sitting duck for someone who wants to take advantage of them. I think this is certainly true between the sexes, where there are very few men who are really smart about women, and there are very few women who are really smart about men. Because each of us wanting to kind of get what we want, uh, whatever that might be, we know that the easiest way to do it is a con job. And so there's this constant influx of I don't know what to make of you. I don't know what you're saying to me. I don't know if I can trust you. But it's the same way in business, in politics, in everything else. There's so many, so many more lies out there than there are truth. The Holy Spirit is the one who can come along like a baloney detector and give us the ability to, to, when we hear something that's a lie or when we hear something that's true, he can speak to us from within. And sometimes we don't listen to his voice but he's helping us to be able to find the truth, and that's an important thing. Now, a little later down in the chapter, look at verse 25, John 14. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So the Holy Spirit is also a teacher, That's pretty amazing when you think he will teach you all things. Like anything that you learn, he is involved in that process. He's going to be with you. He's there to help you. Now, he doesn't just magically give you knowledge, but he is alongside of you to not only help you to discern the truth, but to help you to learn. We really couldn't learn. We really couldn't be taught unless he was helping us. And and a part of what he does is, remind us of the words that Jesus gave. This is why it's so important for us to regularly read about what Jesus said. We spent a whole year going through just the sayings of Jesus because a main job of the Holy Spirit is to take the words of Jesus and help those to make sense to us and for us to be able to apply them in certain ways. On Sunday, we talked about the fact that the New Testament tells us that the way we understand God is by understanding Jesus. Jesus said this over and over again. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And as I mentioned Sunday, Hebrews chapter 1, God who back in the past spoke through the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken unto us in his Son. So Jesus is the, is the up-to-date, complete revelation of who God is. And there aren't two gods, an Old Testament God and a New Testament God. There's a God that we try to understand vaguely because we don't have that full revelation of Jesus. When Jesus comes along, everything that Jesus is is what God is because Jesus is God. So the Holy Spirit comes along and reminds us in particular situations. And, and years ago, there was that Um, They were wearing the little jewelry that said WWJD, what would Jesus do? And that's that's an important, the jewelry is not important, but the idea of almost everything in my life when I'm like, I don't know what I should do. If I could just say, what do I think Jesus would do in this situation? It really helps. And the Holy Spirit is the one who takes who Jesus is and, you know, and applies it to our situations and to our lives. So it's really important for him to do that. Otherwise, we can fight with each other about what we think Jesus might do. But the truth is, if you know Jesus, so often, if you allow yourself to be open to whatever it is that God wants you to hear, then 
you will just magically have a sense of what Jesus said, applying it to what you're doing, and just know it's pretty simple usually. It's not complicated. Everything Jesus did was, you know, he put the cookies on the bottom shelf for the most part. He said a lot of things that we don't understand and they didn't understand, but you watched his life, you watched how he treated people, and when I'm treating somebody in a way that Jesus wouldn't treat them that way, I know I'm wrong. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to me, reminding me of what Jesus said. Now, over in chapter 15, look at verses 26 and 27. Jesus says, But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. A big role of the Holy Spirit is to draw attention to Jesus, is to help us to understand Jesus, is to clarify Jesus. Why is that so important? Because when we know Jesus, we know God. You you can't say the same thing about the Father or the Spirit. Because the Father is Spirit, it's hard for us to connect with Him. The Holy Spirit, He like comes and goes, He does things that are different and not always understandable. But Jesus is the God that we could touch, the God that we can know, the God who was personal, the God who became a human. And so what the Holy Spirit does is always speak of Jesus. And by the way, the Holy Spirit doesn't brag on himself. The Holy Spirit doesn't you know, just say, you've got to get more of the Spirit, you need the Spirit, you need the Spirit. He's like, no, it's Jesus. You need to look at Jesus. The Holy Spirit works behind the scenes in order to glorify Jesus Christ himself. And you can kind of look, okay, either the whole, if the Holy Spirit's working, Jesus becomes more clear. It's, it's about him. And so that's what he does. He testifies of Jesus. Now, down in chapter 16, there's a, quite a long section here, but Jesus said, but now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you ask me where are you going. But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. He goes, you guys are bummed that, you know, I say I'm leaving. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment of sin because they don't believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he shall take what is mine and declare it to you." The first thing in the section that's amazing is that they had lived with Jesus for the last three years. And Jesus is saying, when, you, when I'm gone and the Holy Spirit is here with you, that's an upgrade from me being here. I, that's hard to fathom, and I'm sure for them it felt like, you got to be kidding me. When you're here, we could ask you questions all the time. When you're here, you would work miracles. When you're here, you would teach us. And he's like, all that stuff's still going to happen. But it's actually better for you. For one thing, he had to die so that they could be forgiven, so that all of us could be. He had to die so that he could rise from the dead and ascend back into heaven. But more than that, they were, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, about our relationship with the Holy Spirit, but all Jesus could ever be to them as as a man, a God-man, he could only be with them. He could be close to them, he could be around them a lot, he could talk and speak to them, but he says, man, the Holy Spirit, it's better than that because he actually can be in you and ultimately, as we will see, he can come upon you. He can work in you in a way that I can't. And so he's like, Holy Spirit's an upgrade. Now he talks about the Holy Spirit convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So another job of the Holy Spirit is for everyone, whether Christians or not, 
if they feel a conviction, if they feel like I'm doing something wrong, which everyone has that. It's that conscience that, that it's like you do something and you have a guilty conscience. I mean, so the Holy Spirit is the one who's doing that. For most of us, until we figure out how guilty we are, then we're not really looking for grace. We're not looking for forgiveness. If there was someone who truly thought that they hadn't done anything wrong, they're going to have to figure out that they're doing things wrong, and the Holy Spirit is the one who helps them do that, convicts the world of sin. And of righteousness, there's something inside everyone that when you see something that's right, that's attractive. Unless you're a, there's something wrong with you, you're a psychopath or a sociopath, when something right happens, you're like, yeah, it's way better to be right than to be wrong. This is true of all religions, and it's true of people who don't have any religion. In fact, atheists spend an awful lot of their time nowadays trying to convince people that you can have a basis for being good and not being bad without the idea of a god. And maybe that's true. I don't argue with them. I have, but I don't argue with them anymore to say, why would you even care about good and bad if there's no god? But the truth is the Holy Spirit is convicting them to know that there is sin and there is righteousness. There is right and wrong, whether you can explain it by saying that God is the one who made it that way. The Holy Spirit's really working in all of these ways to, to draw people to Christ and to judgment, ultimately, understanding that there are consequences to rejecting um, the truth. But again, he guides you into truth. He leads you toward those things that are true rather than false, and this is so important. But it also, it also says there that he, uh, he will guide you into all truth, and he will tell you things to come. So the Holy Spirit is the one who also can give us the ability to understand what the future holds. Now you might go, I don't think very many people understand what the future holds, but the Holy Spirit, partly through the Word of God, because the Bible talks a lot about our future, and uh, one night we will talk all about biblical prophecy and what we know about what's going to happen eventually and what we've seen that's already been fulfilled. Um, but not only that, it's the idea of things to come is even the Holy Spirit helps us to be able to look at a situation and put pieces together and understand if I do this, then this is going to happen. I'm seeing signs within this person. They're showing some signs of disloyalty. I need to understand where this could be, where this could lead. I, I, I need to, if I'm going to live my life and not waste time with people who are time wasters, then I have to develop a sense of who can I really help and who can I not help and not burn up a whole bunch of energy with people who I know I'm not going to help anyway. Well, how does that happen? It's because you, we have the capacity and the Holy Spirit enhances our imagination. Imagination is the ability to image something, to be able to project. Well, the Holy Spirit is the one that helps us to be able to do that and to, to be able to calculate and see the future. And ultimately, again, it's, he, he's ultimately there to to glorify, as he says in verse 14, he will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So we, we can try to glorify Jesus, but the Holy Spirit is really good at making Jesus look good. Glorify doesn't mean just you're a fan club. It doesn't mean that you're just like inflating someone to a ridiculous extent. It's allowing people to see the truth about someone. We, we also sometimes use the term magnify. And when you magnify something, you zoom in on it. You don't make it something that it isn't. You just allow someone to see more clearly. Like now, I, I'm so thankful. When I'm in a darker restaurant, I can't, can't see the menu at all anymore. But my phone has a light. And with the new uh, iPhone, it also has a magnifying glass in the lens so that you can zoom in. Well, that's what the Holy Spirit does. He doesn't distort things about Jesus. He clarifies things. He allows us to see him 
and to then, you know, to be touched by him in a way that, wow, I see that Jesus is even better than I thought he was. Because, I don't know about you, but in the years that I've followed Jesus, every year I am more amazed that he is better than I even thought he was. And the Holy Spirit does that. He allows us to see Jesus in a way that Jesus is glorified. There's a lot of competition for Jesus. Some people would just glorify people. Like, well, let's just lift people up. Other people would glorify the gifts of the Spirit. Like, let's just focus on that. Other people would glorify our country. Other people would glorify all sorts of things. But it's all about Jesus, ultimately. That's the one that needs to be glorified. And when Jesus is glorified, then you can bet the Holy Spirit's at work. So these are some of the things that he does. But I want to talk a little bit about our relationship with the Holy Spirit. Because if we're going to have all these benefits of the Holy Spirit working in our life, we need to understand how we connect with the Holy Spirit and therefore how he can work in these ways. Now if you look back at John 14 and verse 17, probably just turn back one page, he says that you know him, you know the Holy Spirit already, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Two different prepositions. To dwell with you, that's the word para in the Greek. It means to be, we get our word to be paired with. It's alongside you. In the same way that Jesus was para with them, he said, the Holy Spirit's already with you, whether you realize it or not. But, he said, he will ultimately be in you. And so the, the, the word for in is the word in, the E-N in the Greek. So there's a transition from where he is only with them to where he will be in them. Now, you, can, you don't have to turn there, but um, in John chapter 20 and verse 22, Jesus was in the upper room with the disciples, and he breathed on them, and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, if Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit, they must have received the Holy Spirit. So that was their moment, I would think, when he went from being para with them to being in, in them. Every one who has accepted Jesus Christ has the Holy Spirit in you. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians, that if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you don't even belong to him. So you, he's with you even before you accept Jesus. He comes in you when you invite him into your heart. That's why even the really carnal Corinthian Christians, he said, don't you realize that the Holy Spirit lives in you? Don't you realize that, he, that your body is his temple? So you can be, he can be with you, and then he can also be in you. But in Acts 1.8, Jesus had told them to wait in Jerusalem until the promise of the Father, which he was referring to the Holy Spirit. And he said in, in Acts 1.8 that you will receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. That's the Greek preposition epi. So, you know, and then he says, the sign of that is you'll be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. So Jesus is telling them it's going to happen that while you're here in Jerusalem waiting that the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. He had been with them. He was now in them as he is in any Christian. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, it's a different thing. Now, in the very next chapter, in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came upon them, fell upon them, and, and they all began to speak with other languages. And we'll talk about, uh, the, when we get into the gifts, we'll talk about that a little bit more. But this power that they had, where they were scared and not doing anything, now they were set free to go be witnesses. The boldness of Peter to preach on the day of Pentecost, the boldness of him to confront the leaders, the boldness of a guy who was basically working as a janitor for them, Stephen, who just spoke so boldly, and it makes it really clear throughout the book of Acts, this was happening when the Holy Spirit 
would come upon you. You have a power that you didn't have before. You have an ability to be able to share with others in a way that it's like, man, the Holy Spirit's really working. Now, um, there, there, there are, and there are certainly, um, you know, you can read the book of Acts and see this, how the Holy Spirit came upon them. Sometimes it's referred to as they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. Other times it talks about being filled with the Holy Spirit. And my personal take, and some people differ, I think the first time that the Holy Spirit really comes upon you, um, I, would, I would probably use the term to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Because baptism is an immersive thing that happens initially. You don't keep doing it. Some people do, but most people don't. And so, to me, the first time you allow the Holy Spirit to really empower you and to come upon you, basically, it's to be able to, when, I, I know for me, it was, I finally just said, God, I want everything that you have for my life. I will do anything, and I want everything that you have for me. And I opened my heart to him, and I knew that something was different. However, being filled with the Spirit, to me, is probably when you continue to allow the Holy Spirit to come upon you and to work in your life. And so, you know, for that, it says it in the present tense, um, where Paul says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled. And really, it's in the present tense. It could be translated, if you wanted to be really literal, keep being filled with the Holy Spirit. So allowing his power to come upon you and to work through you can be, you know, the first time that happens, it's, it, it's different with different people. Some people might speak in tongues. Some people might just feel something. Other people talk about, oh, it was like I was in cotton candy or I had other people, it's like, well, nothing, but, but, but the first time that you give yourself over to the Holy Spirit, I call that the baptism of the Spirit. Some people don't like using that term, and I understand that. They just want to call it be filled with the Spirit. R.A. Torrey, who's one of my heroes, um, wrote a book on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and he was really, um, this was a big thing that he and D.L. Moody talked about all the time. He worked for D.L. Moody you know, back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And, and people argued with Tory and said, we have no problem with what you're saying. It's just that we think it should be called be filled with the Spirit, not be baptized with the Spirit. And Tory's response to them was, well, I would rather have the right thing with the wrong name than the wrong thing with the right name any day. So he said, what's obvious is, there are some people who live and serve and function with the power of God working through their lives. And it's obvious that there are other people who love God, have accepted him, therefore we know the Holy Spirit's in them, but they're just not doing anything with it. And so that's his distinction, whether you're filled or not. And uh, the reason I think Paul tells us to keep being filled with the Holy Spirit is because, uh, as Dr. McGee used to say, the reason I need to keep being filled is because I leak a lot. And so, you know, this is a process that we want to go through, but that's, you know, our relationship with him. Now, what if you don't know if you've been filled with the Holy Spirit? What if you don't know if you have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit or not? Maybe you've been scared away from it by wackos and stuff. Well, over in um, Luke chapter 11... And verse 13, I can't remember if it's on your sheet or not, but it's a good verse to read. He says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So whatever it is that you want the Holy Spirit to do in your life, ask Him. And Jesus in other places said, Ask and you'll know that you and believe that you've received. So to me, if you've never, you know, maybe you're not clear on some of this stuff and you're not sure, what could possibly hurt if you just speak to God and say, God, I do want power from you to live this life, to minister to others. 
and I want everything that the Holy Spirit wants for me. He's not going to make you start flying through the air and spinning around the room or something. It's just, do you trust him to say, I want everything that the Holy Spirit has for me? And if that's the prayer of your heart and you mean it, then you can know that you have been baptized with the Holy Spirit or that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You can know that you are filled. Now it's just a question of living that way and continuing to ask him because if you continue to ask, he continues to fill. And so I would just encourage anyone who isn't sure kind of where they stand in terms of their connection, their relationship to the Holy Spirit, just get some time alone and just ask him to do that. And he, and he promises that he will. Now, one of the things that the Holy Spirit does, the New Testament is clear on, is that he gives spiritual gifts. I mentioned the tongues in Acts chapter 2 and a couple other places in Acts. That was the ability to speak a language that you didn't know, or at least for people to be able to hear you speaking in a language. That happened on the day of Pentecost. Um, in 1 Corinthians, and we're going to look, in fact, you can turn over to 1 Corinthians 12. Um, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 is the longest passage of Scripture on spiritual gifts. And so it's, it's an important one. But he lists all these gifts. And in chapter 14, he's mostly addressing the abuse of gifts, and in particular, the abuse of the gift of tongues, which the people in Corinth were really fleshly, but they just loved speaking in tongues. So he, was, he did a lot in 1 Corinthians 14 to kind of clarify that gift. But, you know, look at um, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 8 through 10. He lists some of these gifts. And his point was, everyone has gifts that are there to profit all in the church. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. So the ability to speak a word that's coming from the Holy Spirit, that's a word of wisdom. It doesn't define it. I'm just saying, you know, for some people believe that the word of wisdom is when you just know something and you say it to someone and you couldn't have learned it otherwise. I've had that happen to me. I don't know if it's necessarily a word of wisdom. Probably is, but it could also just be the wisdom to know what to say or to do in a particular situation, how we need wise people. To another, the word of knowledge through the same spirit. Similar gift, hard to discern between them, really. If you're going to discern, wisdom has more to do with life decisions that you make, and knowledge has more to do with things that you know. To another, faith by the same Spirit. So there's a gift of faith, believing strongly. To another, gifts of healings. Interesting that with healings, it's the only one that's, that's plural. And so it's possible that, that healing is the one gift that is given specifically in particular situations. Like, you know, it talks about if you want, you know, if you, if you need healing... You come to the elders' church, anoint with oil, and that in those kinds of situations, God may heal a person who does it, but another time he may not. So maybe a gift of healing isn't something that an individual has, but it's, you know, sometimes I pray with people and I've seen them healed miraculously. Other times I pray for people and nothing happened. Um, but these are gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy, speaking forth the word. To another, the discerning of spirits, the ability to just know something's not right here. Um, to another, different kinds of tongues, which is interesting that, that he calls them kinds of tongues because I think there are some different uses of that gift. And Well, in Acts chapter 2, it seemed primarily to get people's attention so they could then hear the gospel. It wasn't so they could hear the gospel in their own language. They heard people praising God in their own language. But they all spoke, you know, Greek in those days if they were there in Jerusalem. And, and so it, once he preached, he preached in Greek, but tongues were the attention getter. Um, but it, as we read through 1 Corinthians 14, he makes it clear that Tongues are, are not for, you know, assigned to believers, but they're to unbelievers. So tongues is not assigned to tell you something about yourself or to let everybody say, wow, you're really special. 
It's something directed to unbelievers in this case. But at the same time, Paul makes it clear that for him, speaking in tongues, it's prayer. It's a, it's a language by which you can pray to God. He talks about this in Romans 8, that there are times when I don't know how to pray the way I want to pray, and God intercedes, the Spirit intercedes with groanings too deep for words. Paul said he wouldn't speak in tongues in public because he said, I'd rather speak a few words from knowledge you know, than to speak 10,000 words in a tongue and people just think you're nuts. And so it seemed like by the time that Paul was writing this, the gift of tongues, rather than to have that introductory function in Acts 2, that it became more a, a prayer thing because Paul said, I speak in tongues more than you all. But in the church, so see, what he was doing was something that was private and personal and enhancing his own prayer life. And for me personally and in my experience, that's what the gift of tongues is. There are different kinds and different ways, and I'm not going to shut people off if they tell me something different. Um, originally in Acts 2, there were actual foreign languages. There are all kinds of people today who claim that they heard somebody who spoke in an actual foreign language. Um, I don't know. I just know that every time somebody's tried to verify that with recordings and everything, linguists listen to it and go, no, this is not a language. You're just repeating a couple of the same things over and over again. Pastor Chuck used to talk about a, a woman who came to their church. She had never been there before. And in an afterglow, she started speaking in tongues. And our case started speaking in tongues. And this woman said, you're speaking French. And she goes, not only that, it's aristocratic French. And it's like, hmm. But nobody ever saw this lady again, so all they know is that that's what she said. Um, so I, it's hardly proof. Plus the fact that in you know, 60 years of ministry, that's the only story Chuck had about somebody speaking in an actual foreign language. So as somebody who's kind of a bit of a skeptic, I've tried to track down some of these things. Everybody's like, no, I know somebody who did. Then you talk to them, and it's like, well, I didn't actually. It was another guy I know. And, and so, but there may be times when someone, God uses this to help someone speak a language. But for me, the gift of tongues primarily is something in your own devotions. And it, you, shouldn't, you don't become a better Christian by praying in the Spirit, as Paul calls it, or as speaking in tongues. It's, it's just that when you get to the point where you're like, I don't know what else to pray. I'm so, I don't have words to express. Sometimes just try this if you want, when you're by yourself, not like in church. But just, you know, let your mouth go and see what happens. And that's, you know, for me, there are times when having that experience, really, it feels like my spirit's really communicating with God. Um, so, you know, that's, again, that's, that's one of the gifts that he has here, too. And, and um, but also uh, in verse 28, he talks about some other gifts. God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, which were you know, authority figures and basically missionaries. Second, prophets. Third, teachers. After that, miracles. Then gifts of healing. Again, in the plural, interesting. And then a gift of helps. People would just like to help out. Administration, those who are well at organizing things. Varieties of tongues, again. And he says, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? The implied answer is, of course not. Everyone doesn't speak in tongues. Everyone doesn't know how to teach. Everyone doesn't prophesy. But his point is, hey, this is something that the body needs because there are everyone, in, everyone who's a part of the church has certain gifts. And we need to use those gifts because we need everyone. We need people who are different than we are. Now, also, um, he has, uh, um, in Romans 12, there's another list of gifts. So keep in mind all those gifts that, that we talked about, but turn over to Romans 12. And there are basically three passages, 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, Romans 12, and Ephesians 4, that list these gifts. But in in uh, Romans 12, verses 6 through 8, he says, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let's use them. 
If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, so there's a different gift of ministry, let us use it in our ministering or our serving. He who teaches, in teaching. He who exhorts, another gift of somebody who, exhorting doesn't mean pointing your finger at somebody and judging them. That's uh, the only one that has that gift is Satan. You know, he's the accuser of the brethren. But an exhorter, it's the same word that's used for uh, the Holy Spirit as a helper or a comforter. It's, you have the ability to come alongside someone, empathize with them, connect with them. Such an important gift. He who gives with liberality. People have a gift of giving. Now, everyone's commanded to give. Everyone's also commanded to have faith and, and to use knowledge and things like that too. But there are people who have a special ability to, to generate revenue and a special generosity that goes beyond the normal amount of money that people would generally give. So he says, do that liberally. He who leads, somebody who has a gift of leadership, work hard at it with diligence because a lot of times when people lead, they get good at delegating stuff and then they're not working hard themselves. He who shows mercy, there's another gift, the gift of mercy, the gift of being able to just, um, if, you don't, if you don't know what that gift looks like, get to know Cherie down here. She has a powerful gift of showing mercy to people with cheerfulness, which she totally does. Um, and then over in Ephesians 4. Paul in Ephesians 4 gives us a little different list of gifts. And he says in uh, verse 8, first of all, therefore, in, this is the context. He's talking about when Jesus ascended on high, he led captivity captive, that's for another day, and gave gifts to men. And then down in verse 11, he gave some to be apostles. We saw that before in Romans. Some prophets, some evangelists. That's a different one, the ability to really share your faith with someone in a way that, that really impacts them. And some pastors and teachers, that's another gift that's a little different than just the gift of teaching. It's the gift of pastoral teaching. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. All of these gifts are there for that purpose, that we could build each other up. I'm amazed at how many people have experienced being around church and being torn down. That's exactly the opposite of what we should do as Christians. This is a place where we should be built up. Sometimes I tell people who are just complaining all the time, like, just come and tell me when you have something encouraging. I really, I don't, I don't I'm closing the complaint department. I just, I, I'm, not, I'm not there anymore. But see, all of these gifts, the purpose of them is not to glorify the person who's using the gift. It's, it's not to go and disrupt somebody's life or judge them or, or do crazy mind reading tricks or be a magic eight ball for them. The point is we are equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. We're all in the ministry. The job of, of pastors and, and elders and people like that is to try to help other people find ways to discover their gifts and to use their gifts as a part of the body because we all need that. So I don't think this is in a, a completely full, you know, comprehensive list of the gifts because three passages, Ephesians 4, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, um, they all have different lists of gifts. So to me, there are probably other gifts that he doesn't get around to mentioning. And it doesn't even matter what you call it. But I'm, I know some people who are just, and you know, we're blessed to have Anson. Some people are just anointed to use music in a way that touches people's hearts. Some people are anointed writers who write books that, that just like, you're go, like, sometimes I read something that Timothy Keller says or that C.S. Lewis said or, or you know, and G.K. Chesterton or some great writer, A.W. Tozer, and their words are just like, whoa. Well, that's a gift. Some people have gifts of artistic expression. Some people have variations on these gifts where they encourage people by, like my wife does, by, by baking things and making things for people. The whole point of this is we're all gifted. And we all have a different package of gifts. And when we figure out those areas where it's like, God's really using me, that's your gift. And so make sure that you use your gifts. 
Don't sit on them. Don't just you know, kick back and go pout because nobody's asked you to use your gift or whatever. Use your gift. And don't feel like you should be like somebody else. Don't want somebody else's abilities or whatever. Um, don't look down on yourself or don't look down on others. It's just the Holy Spirit's inside of us. When that happens, you know, and again, people don't like the term, but I like it because it says exactly what it is. Magic happens when the Holy Spirit's working in our lives and he gives us abilities and he wants us to use those abilities. But we need to use those gifts in, while using the fruit of the Spirit, which is love. And we, and we have, uh, we'll look just a little bit at the fruit of the Spirit, but before that I wanted to mention something called cessationism. Cessationism comes from the word to cease, and it's the idea that spiritual gifts, or at least some of them, ended at the end of the first century. And so there are a lot of people, uh, John MacArthur's a very famous cessationist, he's, he's made it very popular, um, an awful lot of people in Baptist churches tend to be cessationists, and a lot of other people do. And, and I just to be fair, I understand some of the reasons why people are cessationists. Because for one thing, you've seen so much crazy stuff. You see fake miracles. You see people claiming that God filled their cavities with gold. You see people who claim gold dust is falling from the ceiling. You see this fake mind reading where you know, Peter Popoff was famous for it, where he had a little thing in his ear, and his wife was telling him stuff about people in the audience, and he was acting like God was telling him this stuff. And everybody's witnessed this stuff so much that it's easy just to throw the baby out with the bathwater and just go, eh, the Holy Spirit, everybody who talks about the Holy Spirit turns out to be real wacko, and I just don't want that. And then also, though, when you look at the Scriptures, you look through the book of Acts, and you look in the epistles, it's undeniable that there was a change in how gifts were, were functioning. You, you saw, in a lot of ways, more um, healing miracles in the early part of the book of Acts. You see Paul, uh, later on in life, telling Timothy, if you got a stomachache, drink a little wine for crying out loud. He didn't say, you know, put your hand on the TV. It was like, you know, there was a time when, when Paul would be like, if his shadow went over you, you would be ki killed. So God w does work differently, you know, through various progressions. And, and historically, I think the extremism and the superstition has kind of hurt us here. But 1 Corinthians 13 makes it pretty clear that when the gifts cease is when the perfect has come. And you can, you can turn over there really quickly. And so people who are cessationists would say that the perfect, it's uh, verse 9, uh, well, verse 8, love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away with. And he goes on, now we see through a glass darkly, then we will see face to face. Now abide faith, hope, love, these three, the greatest of these is love. So Paul says, the gifts will cease when the perfect has come. Cessationists would say the perfect was when the canon of scripture was completed, which depending on how you look at it, could be anywhere from you know, 100 AD to 250 AD or something before the canon was really solidified. And that's not, having the whole canon does not mean that now you don't need to have wisdom anymore, or you don't need these, or you don't need healing anymore because now you have your Bible. So I think they're wrong about it, but that's partly where cessationism comes from. But if you look at this, and, and the obvious thing is the perfect is Jesus. He's the one that when he comes, we don't need this stuff anymore. And so to me, I believe that you know all the gifts can be used. I, the Holy Spirit can do whatever he wants. I believe that all the gifts are still active, even though their changes may differ. A side note, when it, it says that tongues, uh, you know, it says prophecies will fail, a sudden stop. Tongues, they will cease. That word is in the Greek, it's in the middle voice, which is different than 
knowledge will vanish away. And so it, it kind of hints at the fact that the gift of tongues is one that did change its usages, just like you said, kinds of tongues. And so it, I just wanted to point that out because some people will say, so it should have died out. I don't see it that way. I just think the uses of it are different. You hear all kinds of crazy theories. There are some people who think the gift of tongues turned into the gift of music. I don't, I don't think so. I don't buy that. But, but notice 1 Corinthians 13, right in the middle of 12 and 14. The chapter on love is stuck in the middle of a discussion of spiritual gifts. And this is the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 through 23 Paul says, and you can look it up later because we're running out of time, but he says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering or patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. The fruit is singular. So the fruit of the Spirit is actually love and joy, peace, patience, gentleness, self-control. All those things are actually defining and and elaborating on what love is. And so when we're talking about the Holy Spirit, if love isn't there, nothing else matters. That's what 1 Corinthians 13 says. You can read it over for yourself. Um, When you get a chance just to be reminded of it, most of you are pretty familiar with it. But Paul says, look, in the middle of all these gifts and all of these things that God's doing and everything the Holy Spirit wants, the one sure thing that the Holy Spirit wants everyone to have Where gifts, he gives different gifts to different people because he likes variety. But for everyone, love is the core of what grows within us when the Holy Spirit is moving in our lives. And, you know, 1 John 4, 7 and 8 says, Beloved, let's love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. If you know God, you will be loving and your love will be obvious. We need to be growing in that direction. How do we do that? The Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, I am looking over my life. I am more thankful for times when God gave me love for someone when they desperately needed it. I'm more thankful for that than I am every Bible study that he's ever helped me to prepare. Because when it comes down to it, a Bible study means nothing without love. A ministry, a life, all of your gifts, doing everything that you're called to do, if love isn't there, it's a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. And that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do. He wants to to love us, to allow us to feel loved, to bear witness with our spirit that we're the children of God that we're his, that we're connected to him, that he seals us, that he protects us, that he's always going to be with us. And when he does that work, the obvious sign is not going to be gifts. The sign of the Holy Spirit being in our lives is love. And you can fake gifts. There are people, I've known people who, who could preach a great sermon. And people are like, wow, they're so anointed. But I knew them, and I didn't even think they even believed what they were saying. They were just talented. There are people who give for the wrong reasons. There are people who can help people because they think they're superior to them or they're codependent, where it's like, when I help somebody else, it makes me feel better about me. All of the gifts can be manufactured. They're not these, wow, miraculous things. This is where your relationship with the Holy Spirit just gets to work, that's all. But love, sooner or later, it's going to come out whether you're loving or not. And for some of us, it leaks out all the time that we're not as loving as we could be. And ultimately, that's what the Holy Spirit comes down to. And it's interesting that in the fruit of the Spirit, he starts with with love, but he ends with self-control. I think this is really important, that when the Holy Spirit is working in our lives, developing our character, ultimately, the sign of that is my life is under control. I am taking control of various areas of my life because that's how I can then be 
productive and fruitful. It's why sometimes if you have an area of your life that's just out of control and then you really work on it and you have victory, it helps all kinds of other areas of your lives because you're allowing the Holy Spirit to work and to do what he does. And ultimately, you're unloving to not do that, unloving to yourself, unloving to others. So there's so much more that we could say, but that's kind of all we have time to talk about tonight on the Holy Spirit. I have other uh, teachings and stuff if you, if you want to go into more detail. But the, the, the guts of the whole thing is, if you have accepted Jesus, the Holy Spirit actually lives inside you. If you have asked him to, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and give you ability to do things that you can't. If you are his child, and if you are filled with his Spirit, you have gifts where there are things that you can do that help everyone in the body of Christ. And you need to find out what those gifts are and then take a hard look in the mirror, read what love is in 1 Corinthians 13, patient and kind and all those things, and ask yourself, am I seeing that grow in my own life? If I don't, I don't like try to do it differently. It's fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. And I just need to get with him more and allow him to do that work in my life. I can't start with self-control. I need to start with love, and I will end with self-control. If you turn it around, you just become, you know, Dale Carnegie. So nothing against Dale Carnegie is great, but, but you know, it's, it's, this isn't a self-improvement course. It's being touched and healed and, and helped from the core of your being. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. And I'm thankful for people who, when you talk to them, you just see love oozing out of them. That's because they have certain gifts that really work with that. There are others who have a struggle coming across like they really care. They have to work on that. They have other gifts. They have other things that they do. Ultimately, the church needs everyone to be all in, to be involved, to be asking the Holy Spirit to work in our lives, to work in our church. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your Holy Spirit. We sometimes just think it'd be so cool to have you here. And yet you told us that you are here because the Holy Spirit's here. But we believe you when you say that we're better off now than your disciples were back then. Sorry for taking the Holy Spirit so for granted sometimes, not even thinking about him, not even listening to him, not even asking him to give us wisdom and discernment, to show us the truth, to give us words to say, to understand your word. Lord, help us to be in a vital relationship with your Holy Spirit, because I know that's what you want for us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.